Hi, I'm Darren Steele, and this is Think Queerly, a personal evolution podcast for queer thinkers, change makers, and creatives. And today on the show, I'd like to welcome author David Demchuk. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I'll do a brief introduction and then we'll get into why you're on the show today and I'll have more information in all the show notes. So the book we're going to be talking about is your second novel titled Red X and it's about a series of disappearances from Toronto's gay community over a 40-year period and it's noted it's actually over 200 years and we're going to get into that sort of interesting, um, call it a segue, call it a deeper dive into the the backstory uh, and the efforts of surviving friends and family to find out who or what is responsible for these disappearing people. So interwoven is your own story as a horror writer, as a gay man, and as someone whose novel is breaching the boundaries of fiction and entering his own life. That's pretty accurate. (laughs) Well, I would say you know, and the, and the funny thing and the interesting thing for um, for listeners here today is that we live in the same building and here we are doing this virtually because, well, it's easier for me to do a podcast recording virtually like this. But through someone who works in the building, um, it was because I was reading something in the Globe and Mail about your novel and I reached out and I said, can you do me a favor and do an introduction since we know each other and you know David and I think that's just a more proper way of doing it. And, you know, you gave me the novel to review and I have to say I was absorbed, which to me is a very good sign for a couple of reasons. Either it's just a really good story or it's really good writing but it was both. And for me, like to be absorbed in how well you tell this story. And I would almost want to say efficiently in some ways, just because there was never a point at which I was distracted by, you know, was this a tough sentence to read or was this really convoluted? I, to me, I admire that as I'm evolving as a writer, not an author of fiction. Um, so my compliments to you, because I just couldn't put it down. Well, thank you very much. I mean, obviously, you know, every writer is going to say, oh, well, that's the intended effect. And, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I benefited from having a story that was really compelling to me and, and the trick for writing a long narrative, at least for me, is that I have to keep finding new and interesting ways to engage myself Mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to engage a reader. But without, I mean, it's a, I mean, I will say that (laughs) there's no shortage of gimmicks in the book if you think of the book as being gimmicky, but at the same time, I, I, whatever I employ in order to, to keep a reader interested and in order to keep myself interested, really has to be at the service of the work and not at the service of making me look good. It's nice if I do look good. And the other thing I have to say, and I have to credit everyone who's been involved in the creation of a book, it's really, I don't think there is a book really that is one person from beginning to end. I benefited from having um, a tremendous editor who was also my publisher, uh, Jordan Ginsburg, who, um, who, really urged me to, in many ways, expand the book, even as uh, you felt that it was efficient and economical. And I feel that way as well. When I handed it in, it was about 55,000 words. And working with him, it expanded to about 85,000 words, which is not how it normally goes. And it's not what writers normally enjoy. (laughs) It's much it's much preferable to hand in something that's long and then chop it down right. than it is to sit there and go, oh, this sentence should really be a paragraph. This section should really be three paragraphs. This, you know, um, that can be really tough, but it was very really important to, to give the book the kind of texture that it has. And in particular, to try to chart the change within the city of Toronto and within the queer community within the city of Toronto, um, from the beginning of the book, which is more or less 1984 to, I think it ends around 2016. And, and so um, really a little later, but we'll just say 2016. And, 
and I think that um, I mean I I don't I wouldn't go so far as to say the city is a character in itself, mm-hmm. but the setting is complex because a city is complex, and the changing, growing, mutating nature of the city um, is very important as a backdrop for the characters and how their relationship to uh, the village, to the queer community, to the larger city um, changes over the course of the book. So at this point, probably it'd be a really good um, place for you to tell us a synopsis of uh, the setting, the idea of the book, the overall storyline. Sure. Um, Well, as you say, the the book deals um, over the course of a 40 year period in approximately eight year increments um, with the disappearances of a number of men um, from within or around uh, Toronto's gay village. Mm -hmm. Uh, The gay village of 1984 is very different from the gay village we have, well, at the end of the book, but you know, even more so today with the pandemic and stuff like that. And um, I mean, gentrification has been an issue in the gay community. Safety has been an issue in the gay community. The changing nature of the queer population has been an issue. And also the threats uh, that the queer community faces uh, from outside, some Mm -hmm. of which are are perennial, some of which go back, you know, many decades, you know, theoretically hundreds of years, you know, government intervention, police intervention, um, hostility and abuse. But there are also things that uh, that prey on the gay community that are that are different or ever changing um, substance use, um, poverty, um, the changing nature of uh, a city and how a city relates to its queer community. You know, does it embrace them? Does it drive them out? Does it see mm-hmm. the economic advantage of them? Does it prey on that? Those kinds of things mm-hmm. um, uh, have also played an important part. Um, over the course, I mean, of course, there's a real life correlate, which I deal with in the book, but in the fictional aspect, um, it being a horror novel, there's a monster. <laughs> it's not a big secret. Uh, you can pretty much figure out there's a monster just from reading the cover flap. Yeah. Um, there is a monster that's preying on the community. It's been doing so for uh, as long as Toronto has been a city and even before. Mm-hmm. Um, it has come to us from another country. It um, it can appear in the guise of an attractive young man, but it can also appear in other guises one of which is fairly consistently um, a very large, very ferocious dog uh, known as a black shuck or a bargast. Mm-hmm. There are a number of names for this kind of creature. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it is identifying men who are lonely, men who are vulnerable, who are disconnected from mm-hmm. their community one way or another. And it lures them and it eats them. It just mm-hmm. has to be said. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> So as I was writing it, and even before I was writing it, obviously, because I would have had to plan the book out to some extent, I was in dialogue with the material as a writer, as a queer writer, and as a writer who um, is a huge horror fan. And so the dialogue that I was having with myself, which I actually include in the book in the form of a number of sort of essays or diary like entries, um, is what is my relationship as a queer man to horror as a genre? Mm -hmm. Um, Horror has traditionally seen queerness as being monstrous. Um, there's a lot that's being done now in the genre to sort of turn that inside out. And I, I'm one of those people who's eager to do that myself. But at the same time, there's a ferocious sort of othering of queer people in horror as a genre, and really in fiction overall, but particularly in genre fiction. And why was I attracted to horror? Why was I interested in employing those tropes? How was I going to be able to turn them inside out? Um, and also I was interested in... Um, in disability. I have a disability that is um, peculiar mm-hmm. and rare. And, uh, and if you read the book, you'll discover highly obnoxious. And, uh, and so my relationship with my body, my, my disability, uh, my own relationship with queerness, also um, a, a big part of what's going on in the book is, is my relationship, perhaps our relationship with our city's history with our city's colonial past. Mm-hmm. And 
and particularly in the form of uh, noted Toronto personage Alexander Wood, who um, came over at the birth of the city of York, effectively, and uh, became prominent here, and then uh, suffered a queer scandal um, that may or may not have involved him sexually abusing uh, some young men. And mm -hmm. of course, this man has a statue, <laughs> a big bronze statue in, mm -hmm. uh, in Toronto's gay village. And uh, there's a lot of discussion now about whether it's appropriate for it to be there, considering um, his supposed past, and in, in fact, more than supposed in some in some instances, you know, confirmed past, yeah. and and <clears throat> why him and not somebody else? Why why would you have this person there? So that um, is very much part of the story as well. Mm -hmm. As a horror novel, over the course of time, people who are survivors of those who disappear, um, the friends, the family members, come to realize that something is going on. They are brought together rather than come together because they don't recognize really until quite a bit later on what their commonality is. Yeah. And they have to figure out whether or not there is a way to find and defeat this creature. Um, and, um, and if there isn't, and there might not be, um, what you do then? What do you do if the, the destructive force that is in your community um, <clears throat> can't be vanquished? Mm -hmm. can't be appeased, won't go away. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of those kinds of questions over the course of the book. And um, the horror parts of it are very real as horror fiction goes. You know, they, if you like a scary book, it's a scary book. But there are other things that are going on in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I would say, my best summary of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you say it's a, it's a scary book, um, it builds over time. It's really interesting. There isn't anything like, you know, jump outside of a jump out from behind the bushes kind of thing. But there's it, you know, I suppose that's why movies are great for that, because th there's always that shock factor. And there's that visual where you don't see and then suddenly it's both the visual, it's the light, it's the sound that makes you jump out of your skin. Oh yeah. Whereas with reading, you're going word by word in a linear fashion. There's there's nothing more than the words in front of you to you know affect your senses. So it's kind of a little bit hair raising along the way, where you know in that first uh, section or chapter, 1984, you, you get a sense of what's building towards the end of it. And then as you go into other chapters, then there are just these, uh, call it insidious elements or these aspects that are hinted at. And I think picking up on many of the things that you mentioned just now, uh, these very political concerns like colonialism or othering or you know the relationship to the bruce macarthur murders over the course of many years uh the role of policing in the community this constant feel of being subjugated as you know a queer person and having to fend for yourself and if you don't have support, you said the monster would eat you. I was thinking it's being consumed by the dominant culture. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and in many cases, you don't need a monster to eat somebody. Yeah. You know, we know there are many instances throughout the book where people, like <clears throat> the obvious conclusions that people come to are, you know, this person has killed themselves. This person has fled the city. This person <clears throat> has has gone back to the country that they came from. Mm -hmm. This person has been subsumed, um, sort of in a drug subculture. Mm -hmm. There's there are those those kinds of things that immediately leap to people's minds because, mm -hmm. um, or at a particular period, this person has died of AIDS anonymously yeah. uh, in a hospital somewhere. No one would ever know. You mm -hmm. know, this was before the era of Facebook, where you would at least be able to communicate to other people, for, you know, friends, uh, co-workers, and so on. Um, prior to the internet, if people disappeared, they disappeared. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> that reality um, 
is terrifying enough, was certainly terrifying enough when, when I moved to Toronto. I moved to Toronto in 1984, which is why I remember that year so well mm -hmm. and, why I, and why I decided to start the book with it. Um, and, um, but from 1984 onward, there was this, you know, friends were dying, people were vanishing. You didn't know from, from one week to the next uh, where somebody was going to be, what was happening with people. The drugs weren't working. You know, People would go into the hospital and never come out. Family yeah. members and friends wouldn't be allowed to see them. If you did see them, it was a horror show. Mm -hmm. so, so those kinds of things were scary enough. Mm -hmm. And um, a monster almost seems like beside the point, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like, you know, here's what the real terror is, you know, in the gay world. And it's been really, I mean, I always knew the book would find, as you would expect, a home uh, with other gay men, with people in the queer community. It's been really gratifying um, hearing from younger queer people who did not have as fully as full an awareness of what it was like in the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the book uh, gives them a strong sense of what that period was like. But it's also really interesting having straight people read it um, mm -hmm. and straight people who never really who may have had gay friends or may have them now but have never really delved into the the constant fear the constant dread the anxiety that comes from being an out gay person um, in a large city or in a small town or anywhere um, and and having sort of their eyes open to that and having them realize um, the, the constant erosion that occurs, uh, the, the longer you live, <laughs> you know, people talk now about microaggressions. I wish we had that word when I was younger, because it was yeah. absolutely what was going on yeah. where you just, even if you were accepted as a queer person, there was still <clears throat> this, this, this constant wearing away of you as you faced, um, tiny prejudices, tiny examples of hostility, um, tiny moments of coldness, tiny moments of, of not just not understanding, but refusing to understand mm. that you just carry with you, you know, grain by grain, you know, you end up with a sack of sand over the course of your life that you just carry with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and it, to me, it was very important um, to convey that in the book. It is absolutely a political book. I don't think a lot of people expect when they pick up a horror novel, mm -hmm. I mean, some people I think probably look at it and go, "Oh, this will be fun. <laughs> yeah. This will be an escape. I'll get to I'll get to sort of submerge myself in other people's problems, and their problems are going to be so much worse than mine." <laughs> and then, you know, unfortunately, I ruin their weekend. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, no, no, you're not getting away. <laughs> well, you know what? All those not... problems are right here. <laughs> it's not dissimilar when you put it that way to a really um, socially observant or political comedian. Um, I, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, uh, what is the name of, of, of the person that's out of Australia or tends? Um, oh. oh, the person who did, are you thinking of Nanette? Nanette, yes. Um, last name is Gadsby. Yes, Hannah Gadsby. Say? Hannah Gadsby. So, <laughs> so, you know, there is someone who is absolutely a brilliant, highly intelligent comedian. And with, you know, their first Netflix show, they, they pull you in and then they rip your humanity right out from you and, you know, just expose you to being aware that e even if you're someone who suffers from what, you know, she's explaining and talking about, um, it is incumbent upon you to also somehow uh, feel. And, you know, isn't that I, what great comedy is about? <laughs> it really can be because it's, it's disarming, right? Because if yes, it disarms you absolutely. by getting like you're laughing and you're feeling comfortable and safe. Mm -hmm. and, and then, then suddenly kaboom. you're not. And so maybe, you know, I was sort of I, I hadn't put these two things together. But when you explained it that way, I think that is one of the major elements of this book it's also why i wanted you have you on the show because think queerly isn't a literary podcast it is about queerness it is about thinking in different ways it's about thought leadership it's about creativity it's about you know how we bring different things to the world as as queer people and this these microaggressions these being constantly being eaten away um so 
you know, in, in how you tell the story, how do I put it? You know, I said to you before we started recording that we're contemporary enough sort of in experience and age of the community. Like I, I moved to Ottawa in 86 and came back to Toronto in 97, but you know, was back and forth with business and the way in which you fictionalize, but tell the settings of like being at the barn or being at boots, these different bars or being at Allen gardens or being down at cherry beach is like, I could feel it. I could sense it. I was there, you know, the steps on church street, the, the fact that you were able to take the real setting and the, and the real essence of the time, uh, to tell this story. So it's interesting to me that you said when straight people were to read the novel, the sense that they would get from this or that younger people, because one of the things that's very challenging is to communicate how fucking difficult it was during the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and how, how it is difficult in different ways in different countries and still in Toronto. But what we didn't have compared to what we have now, the freedoms that we didn't have compared to the freedoms that we have now, and it ain't perfect, but it is a reminder. And I, I love to wrap up here the, the way you've talked about carrying this bag of sand, these grains of sand. And, you know, in the work I do coaching with some clients, like the gay shame that some gay men feel, or the, the shame some LGBTQ people feel as a result of having to grow up in a world that said, screw you, you know, you're not valid. And, and how that really affects us. Oh, totally. I mean, the, the one example that of course, you know, springs to mind is that for, for many of us, Mm -hmm. uh, gay marriage was a watershed and they, people forget how recently gay marriage came into being and how um, up until the moment that it was uh, secured across the country, it it constantly felt like it would never happen. And um, it's not the be all and end all by any means. It Mm -hmm. solved some problems and perhaps exacerbated others, but Mm -hmm. it was for many of us a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that um, I think was really interesting for us, of course, in Toronto was the bats rates and this just understanding up until the moment that that queers fought back, yeah. that you were always going to have um, raids by the police, yeah. sudden visits to the bar, you know, under the under the guise of, you know, oh, we're counting the capacity. Mm-hmm. Oh, we're checking the ages of people. We're making sure there are no drugs being done in the washroom. Well, what you're doing is you're basically just, you know, picking away moment by moment, persecuting people and just reminding people over and over again, you are mm-hmm. less than us. Mm-hmm. And this was a constant thing throughout the entire, you know, the entire village and throughout the community as a whole. Before they were raiding bars, they were raiding house parties. Like this is a thing that is just intrinsic to our history. And there was never a moment where the police or the government really thought, oh, well, they're going to fight back because it had not been in our nature to fight back. It had been in our nature to put up with it. And and once we did start fighting back and fighting back violently, Mm -hmm. it made for a a tremendous change. And it made for a tremendous change in our allies because many of them stepped up Mm -hmm. and many of them said, you know what? It isn't fair. It isn't right. This Mm -hmm. isn't appropriate. Why is this happening? You know? Mm -hmm. And, and so there was a real turning point in that moment, but that turning point came out of real rage. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I will say (laughs) I'm doing a great job of selling this book. I'm making it sound like the most miserable experience in the world. One thing I'll say that is a driving force of the book, because it's a driving force of my life, is that anger. Yes. Is that rage. It is a very angry book. It is not a hopeless book. There is hope at the end of the book. It's a very odd hope, but there is hope at the end of the book. But it is a very angry book. And um, because it was coming from... um, a number of things that were going on our in our community yeah. that I felt really angry about. Yeah. And, and you need, I think, maybe it's just me, I need that kind of energy, that mm-hmm. kind of force to carry me through on a long project. Right. There are some projects, I suppose, where 
it can be like throwing a party for yourself day after day after day. And you think to yourself, oh, I love these people. I love spending time with them. You know, I, I love, you know, seeing how they interact with each other. I love, I love the setting they're in. You know, if I was writing Regency romances and I was any good at it, you know, maybe that's what it would be like. But I don't. <laughs> I write people who I love. And then I do terrible things to them, I do horrible <laughs> trials, and and you know, and some of them die. You know, I sit there and I cry when I kill somebody off or when I mm. kill off their dog. And then another day, you know, I like I come this close. What, you know, I won't spoil anything, but there was one particular character where I came this close to killing them off, and I was like, I can't. I'm like sobbing on the couch. I'm like, I can't do it. I have to find another way. I have mm. to find another way. Mm -hmm. And the person who I was going to kill off literally gets dragged from their death in the book <laughs> and i'm like and i was so happy and so so a lot of what i'm feeling through that whole through that whole process it's really important for me to be able to impart to the reader so that the reader has those feelings too and i mean one of the truisms about writing a novel is that you know it can take a you know four days to write a page that someone's going to read in three minutes and so you never really have the experience that a reader has yeah. of of reading your work because your process um essentially you know always slows the the narrative down and so because you have to get into it in detail, the words have to land us right, you have to do all this editing. <clears throat> so you never have, you're never fresh to it. You know, mm -hmm. the moment you write the first sentence, everything is kind of compromised for you as a, as a writer, but you learn to sort of overcome that um, th through the process by envisioning how a reader is supposed to react. Right. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging thing. And it's a really challenging thing to, to open up in a reader those kinds of emotions uh, because it's never guaranteed you're never sure if you're going to scare somebody you're never sure if you're going to make somebody cry you're never sure it's really hard to make somebody laugh and <laughs> and you want to have that range of emotion when when readers are are you know approaching your material and are going through it yeah. and and so it's you know it's hard <laughs> is what it is it's hard but but to me it's a really important process it was a really important book for me to write just from from the point of view of personal growth yeah and i think that shows in the book as well well it it is a very personal book and there's like i want to come back to this a couple things and i i thought it was interesting that you said it's a very angry book like i I did not get angry reading the book. So like, just almost like as a, um, a caveat for a potential reader, I, I my assumption for but what you said is that it took the anger of lived experience to be able to find the way to put down on the page, the message through the fiction. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And that it is so political in its nature by pulling from real life uh situations like i noticed i think in the acknowledgments i think you mentioned tim mccaskill and i'm, I'm starting to read um uh queer progress his uh, second book and hoping to interview him in january or february as well you know looking at that turning point in the 80s with the body politic uh the predecessor to pink triangle press and then extra and extra online um you know, and I used to work for Pink Triangle Press, but just there's this aspect, perhaps I wonder for you of almost redemption in being able to get your truth out, your anger out, your response to these events in the book as a way of trying to, this is a conceptual kind of question for you, in that, as you said, straight people, younger people reading it and giving you this feedback, the redemption would be they get it. I yeah, I think that's true. I uh, I mean, the first the first audience you know for any book is yourself. So yeah. if there's redemption that I'm seeking, perhaps that redemption is really for myself. And if there's catharsis that I'm seeking, you know, it's it's for me first. And you know what? Um, I, I'm just going to interrupt and say it's, I probably catharsis is the better word than redemption. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk 
um, as you might expect, around horror and catharsis, because yeah. people, I think, want to believe that when you when you reach you know whatever it is the climax of the book the you know the final moments of the book that there is some there is some release that there is some sort of you know <clears throat> reckoning that takes place either within yourself as a writer or within your relationship with the reader or with you know the negative forces in the world at large um, and sometimes that's true I am I'm I, there is definitely in the denouement of the book mm -hmm. there is that feeling of of reaching a place of a kind of completeness and mm -hmm. for me as 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 a writer and as a presence in the book um some sort of path forward mm -hmm. but it's but it's not as easy and as simple as something like the monster is dead our lives can continue and in fact the book argues very strongly against that yeah. <laughs> the, bo the book says very strongly there's always another monster and um and this is um a particularly challenging statement to make when you know that the monster has been has uh has basically been able to integrate themselves into the community to sort of invisibilize themselves mm. into the community and has been able to prey on the community from within <clears throat> and um and so if there's always another monster does that mean and i don't really answer it but mm. does that mean that there's always another monster inside or is it always going to be a combination of forces from inside and outside that we're constantly going to have to battle <clears throat> in order to make our way through our lives and uh and in order to give our younger people the tools they need in order to be able to fight for themselves yeah. and uh, which itself is a very political message <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so uh, um so yeah i mean i i, I uh, there's always <laughs> as you might expect there's always a great sense of relief <laughs> when you get to the end yeah. of, of writing a book or you get to the end of the editing process or you get to the end and you have the finished book in your hands. Um, but uh, I find the best writing for myself comes from asking questions that really can't ever be answered mm. and from charting processes that can't really ever be finished, that they're right. going to have to be carried on in other books, in other works um really throughout the rest of my life so those yeah. questions keep coming up again and again those challenges keep coming up again and again albeit in different forms uh, in different guises i um asked if you wouldn't mind uh to read uh from page 207 one of your um uh, sort of almost journal or memoir like entries uh that really speaks to the the queerness um and perhaps also the 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 rage that you're speaking about. Oh, for sure. Um, this comes actually in a in a a small section uh, fairly late in the book that talks about sort of the history of queer characters and queerness as as an atmosphere or as a plot point or whatever in horror. And um, I'll just I'll just say a couple of things before I read that paragraph. Yeah. Um, earlier on, it says, for centuries, queerness and horror have been intertwined, horror relying on queerness for shock and pungency, and queerness relying on horror for visibility and validation. The genre we describe as horror today has its roots in the romance and gothic genres of the 18th century, which in turn were influenced by the pre-romantic movement known as the Graveyard Poets. The more gruesome works of Marlowe, Shakespeare, Webster, and Middleton, as well as the works of Milton and Dante, which described in graphic detail the torments of hell that await those who have sinned. Um, and then I described some examples um, from that period and from, and from the 19th century of how queerness is represented as something horrific, monstrous, grotesque, deformed, um, um, insidious, uh, manipulative, <laughs> yes. all those things, all yeah. the bad things. But as we know, as you and I know, the most interesting characters in most of these stories are the villains. Yes. The, you know, the queer char characters are the characters you want to hang out with. <laughs> they're the ones who have the, the most activity. They're the ones who say the funniest, nastiest things. Sometimes they do the funniest, nastiest things. And so there's, there's a real attraction to them that you know can only be coming from queer writers um, who are trying any way they can to, to create some kind of representation in their work. Yeah. And so later on I say, 
Queer writers found we could work within the confines of this most conservative genre, using metaphor and illusion to describe meeting places, encounters, relationships, occupations, and networks through which queer people could find each other, gather, and form community. At least for a while, it was better to be seen as a monster than to remain unseen. However, in our zeal to use the genre to portray some aspect of ourselves, what we most often revealed or were required to reveal was our self-hatred. For queer readers, hatred and self-hatred were the stinging medicines we were forced to consume if we were to satisfy our need to see ourselves. And that, I mean, in some ways, for, for older, more conservative queer writers in a number of genres, that continues to be the way they think. Yeah. They continue to, to demonize themselves or demonize uh, their you know, fellow community members mm. or aspects of themselves um, in order to, to be able to put forward any portrayal of queerness. Yeah. Um, it's changing. Um, things are things are moving along and are moving along faster than I actually thought they would, you know, when I was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, there were things that I thought I would never see in my lifetime that I have certainly, you know, seen and appreciated. But um, and there are certainly writers and um, who are who are playing with um, the idea of the monstrousness of queerness and and who, um, you know, and know they're playing a kind of a wicked game with the viewer and the viewer understands that it's a game and understands yeah. that it's not meant to be a realistic <clears throat> representation of queerness but that is a very sophisticated approach and it in some cases presumes that we have overcome a certain amount of prejudice and we have overcome um you know that that innate feeling that still a large part of the population has that queer people are evil, that queer people are predatory, that queer yeah. people are monstrous. So, um, so yeah, it's 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 still an issue to this very day. Yeah. So, one of the thoughts I had on, it, and and <laughs> I always tend to overthink sometimes. So the questions are the things that are going to come out of my mouth. So I make sure they come out the right way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> But what I think is a great, here's how I say it here, what is a really great strength and really unique uh, for me in this book is, you know, how you go between what looks like memoir journal into the fiction and then how later on in the book, it becomes like, is this like fictional journal? Some of this sounds real. And now then suddenly you insert yourself into the fiction and it's no longer a journal, but it's this bridging, I think, between, you know, the real world documentable, documentable, <laughs> uh, the things that actually happened <laughs> that yes. you can go and look up in the newspapers or on microfiche or on the internet and say, yes, that cre give more of a foundation and, and help as both reference and to be built upon for cr showing that rage for telling more of that horror. And, you know, for me, I think it was one of the journal uh, like sections where you're talking about the, the gruesome killings in New York. And that uh, became the book, I guess, uh, cruising and how people got upset about the film. This was a uh, men were found murdered over many years, chopped up and then in plastic bags thrown away. And I think you also mentioned the murder of the shoeshine boy, Emmanuel Jacques in Toronto. Um, and, you know, I wrote uh, an article about that many years ago, because I remember uh, when I was 11 or 12 years old, re seeing that news in the Toronto Star. And this is what you alluded to in some of the points in, in the fear of being queer when you're trying to discern who you are as an identity. So at 11 or 12 years old, I wondered, you know, where are these men? Are they are they naked with other men? Are, you know, are their addresses listed? And I remember walking down University Avenue with my dad, passing two guys in leather and chaps. And I don't remember what he said, but I wondered where they were going. At twelve years old, I was afraid, and you know, too young to be sexually turned on, but like wanting to know, even though it was macabre, even though it seemed to defy safety from my very existence, I somehow had to know where this difference was that I was strangely attracted to and knew was somehow me. Yeah. 
absolutely. I mean, when I was when I was um, that age and even younger, yeah. of course, you know, there was just um, starting on television to be a presence of of queer people as well. Mm -hmm. And in the news, you would hear stories, you know, about, you know, bars being raided about, you know, uh, certain scandals among, you know, either celebrities or politicians or people in the community. Um, and you would become aware that there was this thing about called being gay mm -hmm. and that there were these, you know, schoolyard slurs that were associated with it. And, you know, and that immediate struggle of, you know, that's not me, but is it me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not a bad person, but am I a bad person? Am I a mm -hmm, bad person mm -hmm. for just being myself? Who are these people? And always it's like, you know, who are these people? What do they look like? And you're given some examples. I mean, obviously, you know, throughout our childhood, it was very stereotypic examples. Some of them are, are introduced into like sitcoms or sketch shows as being instant, immediate visual jokes. Yeah. And, and you think to yourself, oh, I see what I am. I am a joke. But am I a joke? Am I a monster? Am I, a, you know, am I, you know, all of these things start coming to mind and you start measuring them against yourself and you start trying to figure out what this means for you. Also, you start asking yourself, okay, these people exist. Mm. You have an example, even if they're being ridiculed, even if they're being, you know, sort of, you know, uh, caricatured, you, you think to yourself, these people exist. They must exist somewhere. Where do they mm. exist? I live in a city. Where in the city are they? And then you become aware. First, I mean, one of the things you become aware of, particularly when it comes to how gay people are being portrayed as looking, yeah. you think to yourself, okay, well, the caricature is actually based on something real. If you introduce, you know, two leather guys as a joke in a 1970s sitcom, and you see two leather guys on a street, you will think to yourself, aha, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> and then, of course, the question comes up, who are they? Yeah. Where do they live? Where are they going? Yeah. Are there other people like them? One day, will I be able to go and be with them? And then you have the other questions of, will they kill me? <laughs> will they sexually assault me? Will they rob me? Because, of course, that's what you've been taught yeah. all the way along is like, you, you know, will they make me do drugs that I don't want to do? These are the these are the images that you've been fed throughout your youth. And you have to and you immediately the thought is, OK, if I do find my community, my community is a danger. How am I going to navigate my dangerous community? And and it takes a long time. It takes some people a very long time to overcome all of those those prejudices and all of that self-doubt and self-hatred that comes from these portrayals that they've seen in their childhood. Mm -hmm. But what's better? No portrayals? Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that's a very real thing. You could mm -hmm. have no portrayals. You could have no communication about queer people in the media that we digest. And that, <clears throat> that's where the double-edged sword comes in. And, yeah. and so obviously, as queer people, we strive to try to have more positive and really real, you know, more realistic rather than, you know, focusing entirely on the positive, more realistic representations of ourselves, our community, the challenges we face um, than what we see in conventional mainstream media. The only way we're going to get that because no one's going to do it for us is we have to contribute it ourselves. There have to be opportunities for us to be able to speak, you know, about our experience in a way that is truthful and 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 then there have to be opportunities for that truth to to reach a larger public um that's what many of us have been struggling towards we're making some headway absolutely but mm -hmm. i know that there are people <clears throat> who are out there thankfully relatively few but there are people who are out there who look at my book and go well this is a really hateful portrayal of the gay community because it's not cheerful, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was never going to be cheerful. It's a horror novel. If I was going yeah. to write something cheerful, it would be a different book. This is yeah. a book that is meant to, you know, to portray something else. Mm -hmm. I like to believe, and I think I'm right, that I have portrayed all of the characters, even the monster, in um, a fairly compassionate yeah. and empathetic way, yeah. um, because I care for my characters. I care for the world they live in. I care what for their relationships. I care for how they navigate that world and with each other. And, and I would, would only ever hope that that caring uh, manifests itself in, you know, as the reader is reading. 
as an example, you know, even the monster without giving it away is suffering at one point and you can't help. But as the reader, you don't, there's no attack on the character by the author or by even the characters in the novel. There is this awareness that this is a corrupted character. And in that the character is corrupted, it almost demands compassion. It yeah. almost demands a sympathy. And its very nature is what it does. And by accepting that, that's just acknowledging its true nature. Well, and I mean, it's a truism as well for horror writers that, I mean, whatever monster you create mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> is your shadow self. Yeah. That um, that you're not. I mean, sure. It's. I mean, yeah. I could write. I wouldn't do it, but I could write a. You know, small town attacked by giant spider. Right. <laughs> yeah. Giant spider has no personality. Giant spider is just being a giant spider. Uh, <laughs> while I think I could write something like that, that would be fun. I don't think I could sustain it because right. I don't have an interest in a giant spider particularly. Mm -hmm. um, to me, there's not a lot of resonance there. Um, <clears throat> I've created a monster that communicates, that has um twisted and unfortunate relationships but relationships all the same mm -hmm. that has a worldview that uh that has self-awareness within that worldview and and so if i've created it clearly it's me yeah so you know and because i am in dialogue with myself throughout the book i am also in dialogue with that creature yeah. um early on um a friend of mine uh dainty smith um uh, a writer a performance artist here in um toronto i gave her an early draft uh once i had finished it and asked her to read it for a number of reasons um and um and I, if she wasn't the very first she was close to being the first and she came back to me it was interesting we had a coffee afterwards and she said you know it's actually a love story and I was, I was actually astonished. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm sure it was very funny. And she said, it is between you and the monster. And I was floored. Yeah. I was completely floored. And in fact, I basically, I think I made it through the rest of our coffee date relatively okay. <laughs> but I, I immediately like gathered up the pages and scuttled home and laid them all out and went, where is this? What is this? But it's true. <laughs> well, you and know, in fact, being confronted with it, I only had to make it more true. It was not something I could cut out. It yeah. was something I had to lean into. Yeah. Um, I, I was just trying to find the exact page, and I think I noted the wrong page number. So I hate having to read something that you wrote instead of having you read okay. it. But I think this relates to what you're talking about here. This is one of the journal sections. And you wrote, as I grew older, this fear of strange men and what they might do, never articulated over, over only ever hinted at, evolved into a fear of gay men, of being pursued by them, by them, of being associated with them, of being teased or arrested or assaulted or killed along with them. Of course, the flip side of fear is desire, isn't it? It's remarkable how many of my fears are queer. Anxiety in gay spaces, in sexual or sexualized spaces, strip bars, back rooms, bathhouses, public washrooms, parks at night, the overwhelming crowds at Pride, and internalized and sometimes externalized homophobia. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. what's I, it's funny. One of the one of the things that I was thinking of during when I was writing that yeah. was uh, many years ago. I was I I was down in the entertainment district mm -hmm. and um and <clears throat> i was aware that the barracks which is no longer there but the mm -hmm. barracks was on widmer yeah. uh street avenue whatever it is and uh and i had never been to a bathhouse mm -hmm. and it was lunch hour and i was on a break from work and i thought to myself i am going to go this bathhouse belongs to me as much as it does to anybody else in the community. Yeah. I have never been in one. I have been in bars. I've been in other spaces. I am going to go to a bathhouse. I am going to go to the bathhouse now. And as you can tell from that kind of internal monologue, there was considerable anxiety about yes. the idea of going in, but it was like, <laughs> I'm going to do it. So, yeah. so I went up and I went to the little, you know, the little sort of booth window and I 
signed my name and I paid my money <clears> and I, I don't know, got my towel or and key to the room because I wisely decided to get a room. And I opened the door and went inside and it was pitch fucking dark. <laughs> I could not see a thing. I had I had absolutely no idea where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do. And it was relatively early. Mm. So there were not even any people in my immediate view, such as it was, where mm -hmm. I could ask. And so I was dimly aware there was a staircase and I sort of felt my way up it. And the whole time I thought, okay, this is like some sort of horrible carnival ride <laughs> where I'm like feeling my way through the maze, right? And, uh, and finally <laughs> I found the room and so on. But it was like, you know, but that, that feeling, that mm -hmm. intense feeling of like, this belongs to me. Yeah. This is a thing that is part of my life as much as any other thing. The only pe person keeping me out of it at this point is me. Yeah. And, and so overcoming that kind of fear, mm -hmm. which was based on nothing, yeah. um, just fear, um, and, uh, and, and thrusting myself, pardon the pun, into that kind of space mm -hmm. um, was just, it was, it was really momentous. Yeah. And yet, you know, I look back now and I go, oh, well, you know, it's kind of trivial because, of course, I have been in now far more sexualized spaces and and have seen, you know, a wide array of things. And 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 it's like, yeah, this is just part of human life. But uh, and it's certainly part of queer life. And I had exoticized it so much and removed myself from it so much that it was this massive burden to overcome. And, you know, if there's anything i wish for for a younger generation it's that you don't have to suffer through that <laughs> you don't have to have those same levels of anxiety i mean i know yeah. the reality is people do because yeah. people have anxiety around sexuality regardless <laughs> of age or generation but are particularly around queer spaces queer spaces welcome you you should feel welcome yeah. you should feel like you are a part of them this is an important you know part of belonging in our larger shared community but oh <laughs> yeah well you know what, what you just said there about um you know fear it you know other than like an in your face existential threat like this big scary dog monster in the book if you were to see that and it was growling at you and like salivating maybe it had rabies or something you know what is fear but a story that has been repeatedly told and then believed and internalized such that if you look out into from your eyes to that bathhouse and all the stories you've been told and you've believed the fear is not real it's not existential it's not there but it is perception it is story it is narrative it is upbringing it's from society it's religious it's belief and that can put us that can make us entirely mo immobile. Yes, absolutely. We're much more vulnerable yeah. to to fears of the mind, yeah. um, and and particularly how they've been created, you know, through the stories we've been told in the past, yeah. supposedly about other people, but really about <clears throat> ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're incredibly susceptible to that, and much more than I mean, fear is fear is a good thing. Fear saves your life. If you yes. if you are in a building, you know, a burning building, and you see flames. You should get out of the building. That is a very, mm -hmm. that is a very real fear response. And it will absolutely, you would hope, make you do the right thing. Um, I mean, it can also confuse you and make you do the wrong thing, but generally speaking, we don't run into the flames. We know to run away from them. When it when it comes though to, to completely manufactured fears, and we are seeing this now, of course, um, with like Q conspiracies and, yes. and anti-vaxxers and a variety of other things. Um, manufactured fears, fears that people come up with out of thin air or out of like the most, you know, thinly connected stuff. We have been the subject of exactly those kinds of terrors, that, that kind of, that kind of creation of stories that are meant to, to, you know, keep us othered from the rest of the community. And we have to overcome them within ourselves. We have to help other people overcome them within our community. And then we have to help the larger community see that these fears are based on nothing, that yeah. these fears are not real. Yeah. Um, and, and then help them overcome it. it. There is a tremendous burden upon us as, you know, as the people who have to basically push this process forward. Yeah. And, um, and it is yet another way 
where we are, you know, exhausted. And I mean, and we actually, you know, as it has to be said, cisgendered white guys, um, bear less of a burden than um, black people, indigenous people, people of color in our community, trans people in our community, mm -hmm. all of whom suffer exactly the same kind of stuff, um, both, you know, in within the community and from outside the community. And, and, you know, and we are all constantly struggling against, you know, the weight of it. Yeah, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. That's a good place probably to, uh, to start to wrap up. Um, Beyond that, any any final thoughts on the book or a, a takeaway or anything else you'd want to share with the listener? One of the things that has been really moving for me <laughs> that I don't get to talk about a lot mm -hmm. is um, the individual responses that I have received uh, from uh, uh, queer people mm -hmm. and trans people about the book. Mm -hmm. um, it has been, I mean, the book has been quite well received. Um, it's been on a few sort of uh, top books of the year list, which is always incredibly gratifying. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, people are, I'm very present on social media, uh, perhaps too present on social media, <laughs> and um, particularly on Twitter, particularly on Instagram. And, and people who, who make a point of finding me of following me and then sending me a message to say that they've read the book and that it speaks to them on a personal level and that it's affected them deeply. Um, you know, there was, I don't have it in front of me, but there was one young person in particular who was reading the book in bed uh, with their partner and, and was crying mm -hmm. uh, um, over a particular section. And the partner said, I, why are you reading something that's causing you so much pain? <laughs> and the and the person said, "Well, it's not pain exactly." Uh, and and you know and and I just thought, like, what what an incredibly powerful and personal thing you're sharing with me, because really, as a writer, it's it, truly none of my business what your reaction to the book is, whether you yeah. love it or hate it, whether it, it affects you or doesn't affect you you whether you whether you find it entertaining or not my job is done you, you know your job is to figure out how you feel about it um i never need to know mm -hmm. um that people reach out to me and tell me and particularly tell me that they're moved is is very affecting for me and um and makes me feel like i have i have i have done my job well Yes. And but also <clears throat> that I have because it is a personal book and I knew going into it that it was going to be a personal book and I was going to be sharing things that weren't necessarily going to be flattering about me either mm -hmm. um, that that someone would reach out to me and was not mm. sufficiently alienated <laughs> by me as a presence in the book yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they felt that they could confide in me. That's a very powerful thing. And there are a lot of people and I realize this because you and I know there are not a lot of people from our generation left right now and yeah. that HIV AIDS has taken many, many wonderful people from us and continues mm -hmm. to take people from us. Mm -hmm. um, and so there isn't really an elder community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to which young people can reach out mm -hmm. and, and, and speak to and ask for advice from and, and get mentored by and, um, and you know, understand what aging queer means. Mm -hmm. There are very few of us, and so uh, when someone reaches out, I know that they're reaching out to somebody who mm -hmm. is not necessarily represented in their immediate circle, yeah. that is not necessarily available to them in their small town. Um, you know, I am an older white male queer cis writer, but I still am a voice that is withheld from them in a lot of ways. Right. And so uh, being able to, to share something themselves is obviously very important to them. And it's tremendously important to me too. So that's been, um, that's been an extremely powerful experience for me with this book. Um, that kind of response doesn't surprise me. I mean, it, it's a very affecting book if if you're in any way sensitive <laughs> and sensitive in the sense of appreciating and understanding and respecting 
um, the process. And it is very much, I think, this structure that is, you know, fiction set in a time and a place that people can relate to because these these things actually did happen, telling a story around it and then mixing in the the who you are in the journal memoir like sections. And, you know, for me, there were a couple of points to me, this is a really good sign of a good book where I stopped at a section and I'd like <gasps> close the book because <laughs> I wanted to spend more time enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to finish anymore because I wanted to sit with what I had just internalized. And, you know, I love me some really good gay fiction, but I like Andrew Hollerhan, Felice Picano. Felice Picano is like, I've, I've, I've got maybe three more books to read by him. And I think he's published 20. And oh, yeah. what I like about- no, He's incredibly prolific. Yeah. What I like about him is I love his memoirs the most for that very reason, because through Felice Picano, you get a telling of a time which may be embellished to quite some extent, but you aren't going to get by just reading a book of history of like, here's what happened in the seventies and on this date and this date. And, and that is what I really felt from your book. It's like, yes, I've been there. Yes. I remember how dingy the barn was. It's like, oh yeah. I remember this back alleyway because yeah. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was very influenced. I mean, I love his work. Um, I was very influenced by Samuel Delaney's uh, three memoirs, uh, Heavenly Breakfast mm -hmm. and The Motion of Light and Water and Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've been lucky enough to meet him a few times. And he's been a, a, a tremendous supportive force Wonderful. in my life and, um, and in my work, particularly um the idea of of bringing a queer sensibility to genre and speaking to uh queer issues and challenges that we face today as opposed to abstract sort of you know fictionalized you know sort of you know manufactured distanced ones mm -hmm. he was you know he was uh, very interested in seeing how i would um tackle real world um issues uh problems through uh, through a genre lens and right. uh, and so i um i'm particularly fond of him but i i mean and that and also i mean andrew holleran who apparently has a new book coming out next year wow that's, i mean <laughs> he's been such a like decades between his last or at least a i know years. it's amazing yeah. to me and these to me are i mean they themselves are standing on the shoulders of giants but these to me are the people who I most, you know, who I grew up with, who I most respect, who I most mm. looked up to, because, you know, they existed in my world, they were not in the distant past, and, um, and, and continue to be with us today. Mm. And, um, mm. and their contributions are enormous, and of course, are hugely influential on my work. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, David, how do people find you? I'm going to include this in the show notes, but let let us know. Well, both on Instagram and on Twitter, yeah. I am known as Spooky Dad. And so that would be, you know, <laughs> at sign, is it a capital S? I don't even remember. It's S-P-0-O-K-Y underscore D-A-D. -D. Uh, um, I'm easy enough to find there. I also have a website, which is daviddemchuk.com. Okay, perfect. I will include all those in the show notes. and. This has been really wonderful. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, I loved the book. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that it connected with you. And I'm so glad it's connecting with so many people and finding a readership because you just never know when you're writing these things, you know, who, who is it going to get to? How is it going to work? And, uh, and it's been, it's just been really lovely. It's made for, you know, I mean, in a very difficult year, Mm -hmm. among a number of difficult years <laughs> um it has been a real highlight for me and uh, um and it's just made me tremendously happy to see it received this way wonderful thank you so much david thank you